Hey everyone, welcome to a new video and thanks as always for watching along. I decided to do a 13,000 mile update because of the recent Rallytech spring install. Um, there's been some questions on those and I've had a lot of questions lately on the, the tires and how they're wearing and a few other things. So I wanted to do an update to kind of just talk about a few of those, those issues. So let's get into the video and uh, if you have any questions or comments as always, please leave those below and you can always email me which you can find below or on my front page. Thanks guys, let's get started. All right guys, so the things I wanted to cover today are number one, the springs and how those are doing. Number two, I wanna talk a little bit about the head unit. Number three, I wanted to talk about the KO2 tires and how they are wearing and what are my thoughts on them after about 10, 11,000 miles now. And I also wanted to talk about the seat wear because I mentioned that uh, probably five, six, seven thousand miles ago. I can't remember now, but I wanted to show you how that's doing. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about what my favorite mod is on the car and then maybe go over just the issues that I've had with the Crosstrek so far. I know I only have 13,000 miles on the car, but I've owned it for almost two years now and I've had a Crosstrek since 2014. So I figured it'd be a good time to get into some of those things. But uh, let's get started with the springs. So let's talk about the springs. Where I left it before was, I gave you some ride height numbers and I had mentioned that I had not lowered the car and uh, loosened everything up and then retorqued it. Um, initially, when I got my first alignment, they had some trouble getting the camber um, lined up totally in spec. And at this point, I still have not done a second alignment, but I was able to um, hang the car off of my carport settle the wheels on the ground and loosen everything up in the back and then retorque. And I did actually get an audible pop on the driver's side, I think it was. So I think those are settled better and I've driven now maybe another, well, I drove it up to Phoenix when we went to Hawaii and I, so that's another 250 miles, 230 miles or so. I have not yet done the fronts and I have not yet had a second alignment, but I do plan to do that in the next couple of weeks. And with the fronts, my plan is to put it on jack stands and then just jack up underneath the suspension to weight it, loosen up the two lower torque bolts, because I just cannot get to those when the car is on the ground, and then retorque them, drive around a little bit more for a couple days, and then take and get it aligned. But as far as numbers go, essentially I'm still about an inch and an eighth higher in the rear than I am in the front. And I think the main reason for that is the fact that, number one, the front has more weight on it with the motor and then the extra 48 pounds from the skid plate and bar. Um, plus, I think, as someone mentioned in the comments, I think part of it is the fact that these springs are actually made so that your car doesn't sag when you load it up. So for towing and when I'm carrying stuff, obviously that's gonna bring the back down probably more in line with the front. So it's nothing I'm really worried about at this point. You can't feel it when you're driving. You can see it when the car's parked. I mean, it's not like, whoa, it's way higher in the back, but you can definitely notice the difference. I had considered possibly doing some half inch spacers or some three inch or three quarter inch spacers up there. Um, Subtle Solutions makes those to kind of even it out. But I think I'll wait and kind of see how it goes when I do tow with it, which is gonna be this week and or when I load up the back. But as far as total height gained in the front, it's about seven sixteenths of an inch, so not an inch. Like they say, it's about an inch when you do it. So in the rear, it ended up being one and three sixteenths inch. So more than an inch in the rear compared to what I had stock. Not sure why that is. I'm, again, I'm guessing it's mostly because of that extra weight that I have on the car, but who knows? So if you guys have Rally Tech Springs, the one inch, let me know how yours came out. Um, I did do some looking around as far as online. I think I found one thread where it was very similar to mine as far as the rear was up higher than the front. So um, just going to go with it. I, don't, I have everything. I've double checked the installation. The springs are compressed equally front and back and from side to side. So I'm guessing at this point, this is just how it is. And, um, you know, it didn't give me, I would like to have at least three quarters of an inch up front, but uh, it's up a little bit more, at least the skid plate's a little bit higher. So I still do plan to do a lift because I really want to get that skid plate up back more to the eight and a half inch, 8.7 inch range. So we'll see how that goes. As I mentioned, the second topic I wanted to cover is the head unit. 
and I went and had the recall done or the head unit update done probably about a week or so before we went uh, on vacation. And since then, I've actually had three or four error messages where the um, when you plug it in, it's saying it's not recognizing it. And generally, when you just unplug it and plug it back in, it works fine. It doesn't seem to be CarPlay specific. It just seems to be that the program is not um, loading properly or something. This is the first time I've seen this. So the head unit uh, problems continue. Mine are not nearly as bad as some of you guys have had. I know there's been people having units replaced and still having problems. So I'm not honestly sure what that's all about. I did get an email while on vacation that there's a new update available, but I believe it's just for navigation and mapping software. And I wanted to show you a little bit of that on the computer. It says that you can automatically download it and have your car check for updates if you're connected to Wi-Fi. So we're gonna go over that a little bit and, and or you can download it onto a USB stick. Again, I don't have navigation, so this is not something I need to do. And it appeared to be only maps for certain parts of the country. So if you have navigation, you probably got that email, but I can uh, go over it a little bit on the computer and uh, so that that'll help anybody out. All right, guys, turn your car on. If you have a limited, push the button twice or turn to the second AC mode. You wanna be the home screen and then you're gonna go into settings and then hit general. And we're gonna scroll down to Wi-Fi and you just wanna make sure your Wi-Fi is on. Okay, once you know it's on, you're gonna go back and you wanna make sure that you are connected to Wi-Fi. So under Wi-Fi settings, it should show your network. You're gonna scroll down to check for updates. And as you'll see with mine, it does not um, download anything because apparently there's nothing for mine to download. Up until about six or eight months ago, as far as I knew, Subaru was not doing over the air updates. And I believe for general head unit updates, they are not, but they are sending these mapping updates over the air or via USB. Um, I do not have navigation, so I've never done one successfully, but I wanted to give you an idea of what this was all about and how to do it if you do have a navigation unit. So hopefully this will be somewhat helpful. Again, I'm not an expert on this because I don't have nav, but um, as you can see, I've tried multiple times here and mine does not work. But there is an update available. You should have got an email if you have nav. One of the, another thing that I wanted to address in this video and is something that I talked about in the past and a lot of questions were asked, especially in the first six months that I bought the car and that was about the AC and how effective I thought it was and did I think it was working since I live in a hot climate and all those things. And being in the middle of my second summer with the 2018, um, I've really come to the conclusion that the AC is basically just adequate. Um, in the past, I've said that, yeah, it seemed to work fine. I didn't think it was quite as good as my 2014's AC and or my STI's um, AC and definitely not as good as other cars I've owned. Someone had suggested quite a few videos ago using the max AC button when you first get in the car, and that definitely made a difference. But I have noticed, like the other day it was 105. Granted, no AC is gonna work great when it's 105, but I left Costco, which is about 20 or 25 minutes from home, and it really didn't cool down until like the last five minutes um, before getting home. And it's never been, in those kind of temperatures, it never gets super cold. Whereas my 911, which is a 2002, and has 120,000 miles on it, within five minutes, that thing will freeze you out of the car. Um, and I know obviously cost-wise, we're in different ballparks, but that car is 20 years old. And to put something in a more recent car that I've driven, which was, I had a Chevy Impala on vacation. And that AC was pretty awesome as well. And we're talking 90, you know, 85, 90 degree temps with 90% humidity while we were on the big island and that AC worked fantastic. I mean, it was the same as the 911. It will cool you down and freeze you out within, you know, five minutes. So I'm not gonna say that the, the Crosstrex AC is horrible because it does work. Um, I still don't like the vent design, especially in the middle. And even on the side one, it's very difficult to get the air to, to blow right at you. And as we, we've talked about in the past, having no vents in the back seems kind of silly. It doesn't seem like it'd be that expensive to throw some vents in the back. Overall, it's fine, but I just wanted to get your guys' opinion now that you know we've all owned these cars for a certain amount of time. Some of the 19 owners are just getting into them. I'm just curious of what you guys are thinking. I don't know what Subaru has changed with the AC since my 2014, 
because I don't ever remember not liking the AC in that car or thinking that it wasn't very good. Um, and one of the things I brought up also is when you accelerate with the 2018, you basically lose all your cool air. And I still do not remember my 2014 doing that. I know some folks have, have commented in the past that their cars did, and I just don't remember it. So um, for some reason, it seemed like that AC was just so much better than the, than the 18. So let me know what your thoughts are on that. And let's move on to the next topic. The third topic I wanted to cover is the KO, the BFG KO2 tires and how they're doing and what I'm thinking about those now that I've have 10 or 11,000 miles on them. I get a lot of questions on the wheels and tires, probably still the most asked topic as far as in the comments and then also by email. And of late, probably the biggest question has been road noise and then how they're wearing. So First and foremost, let me just say, as I mentioned when I first got these things, there is significant, in my opinion, increase in road noise. Um, it's about four decibels that I measured just using a basic iPhone app on the same road at the same speed compared to stock. And if you know anything about decibels, which I learned after doing that video, is that it's compounding. It's not just four is not just four times uh, louder. It's quite a bit louder. So I'm still not sure I understand it completely, but four decibels apparently is pretty significant as far as noise goes. Um, I've heard from other people, if they have a roof rack and have added the KO2s, it really hasn't bothered them. Um, when we did this last drive to Phoenix, I thought it was pretty loud. It wasn't obnoxiously loud, like I didn't ever want to drive the car on the freeway again, but it is loud and um, in the past, I had a Rubicon Jeep that had similar, these tires on them, obviously quite a few years older, but those things got obnoxious at 35,000 miles and were just painful to drive on the freeway. So I'm hoping that these don't turn out that way. So far, they haven't changed from the first time I got them, you know, from when I originally put them on the car to now, they, the noise is the same. Um, driving around in the city, I don't really notice it so much, but on the freeway, it's definitely, uh, you know, 75 to 85. You're gonna notice a difference, and if you're somebody who really likes to have a quiet car and don't do a lot of off-roading, something to consider still. Um, and I've been saying that all along, and I still feel that way about them. For me, I'm still glad I got them, because they're so good off-road, and I go off-road enough that it, for me, it makes sense to have them, just for the protection and all that, and the, the performance of the tire, but, uh, Again, it's something to think about if you're considering getting them. As far as tire wear goes, I'll show you some video here, but um, I haven't really noticed any, you know, after 10, 11,000 miles, I wouldn't expect that you would. And so far they're holding up well. And all the reviews really say 50, 60,000 miles is not hard to do with the KO2. So that's one of the reasons I chose them initially when I was looking at, at uh, all-terrain tires. So um, other than that, can't really complain about them. They've been fantastic off-road and it's just nice to have that um, security uh, for flat protection, hitting rocks, pinching sidewalls, and that extra thickness with the 15 inch wheels. So all in all, it's a positive uh, mod for me. Next, I wanted to talk about the driver's side seat wear. Basically just update you on that. It really doesn't look like it's changed at all. It was something that I had mentioned five or 6,000 miles. I can't remember to be honest with you and I didn't look it up, but Here's some quick video of it. It really hasn't changed um, when compared to the passenger seat. Um, it's basically just wrinkles in the leather. There's no rips or tears or, or significant wear in the seat. Uh, and I know it's not real leather, but it seems to be holding up well and it's comfortable. I find the seats to be fine, like driving to Phoenix. Uh, it's only two and a half hours to where we needed to go, but no problem comfort wise. Um, I still honestly have yet to take a very long trip in the 2018. And I'm trying to think, I don't even think I've had it up to Flagstaff. I have not driven it up to Flagstaff yet, which is actually amazing because we go up there all the time. And last time we went up there, we took the WRX. So um, anyway, seats are doing fine. Other than that little bit of wear on the driver's seat, I haven't had any new, new problems with them. One of the last things I wanted to talk about is what is my favorite mod for the car that I've done so far? And it was kind of a toss up between practicality and looks and performance, to be honest with you. So my first instinct was to say the wheels and tires, just because 
it's just made such a difference off-road and the way it changes the look of the car um, is really significant kind of gives it a masculine look makes it a little bit tougher and it just again like i said it, it really helps you off-road just protection wise and um, traction and all that kind of stuff that was my initial choice but i have to say when i really sit down and consider all of the things i've done i want to go with putting the hitch on the car because that has really allowed me to do a lot of different things and and you know from carrying my four bike rack on the back using it as a camera mount pulling my trailer which i do all the time whether it's going to the dump or getting wood from the store or getting big items and then the hitch basket has basically taken away any problems that I've had with size in the car. So I would say that my favorite mod is definitely putting the hitch on the car just because of all the things I use it for. Just thought I'd throw that in this video just for the heck of it. All right, guys. So finally, I wanted to talk about just the few problems that I've had with the car. If you're new to the channel, you probably haven't heard this yet. Um, for those of you who've been around, you've heard some of these things. But I just wanted to go over just a real short list of things. Uh, obviously, first and foremost is Apple CarPlay. Initially, I had all kinds of problems with that. Um, we talked about in this video the other little head unit issue I'm having right now. And I know there have been countless head unit problems throughout the new units from Harden Carden. So hopefully Subaru has done something with the new Outback and Legacy. They look really nice. Hopefully they've got this problem figured out because it's really, really a pain. All in all, my CarPlay is working fine now. I haven't had issues with that much at all in the last six or eight months, but uh, I'm waiting, <laughs> waiting for that to come back. The one really interesting issue that I had in, uh, suspension wise was that rear sway bar, the, the rear sway bar bushing bolts popping out and falling out and then um, having to pay initially for the damages and then Subaru of America coming through and repaying all that for me. Um, if you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link up, up above. I don't want to go into all the details, but that was really interesting. And also finding out that there were a certain number of VINs that were affected by um, non-factory torque of those bolts from the factory. So check that video out. If you haven't seen it, you may be affected and may be worth getting checked out. It was a really small number of cars, but still worthwhile knowing about. And then the last thing I went through, which just is in the last couple months, was that really loud clunking sound on the driver's side while off-road, um, never on-road. And that Subaru ended up replacing my strut, my spring, and my shock tower mount. And if you don't know, and if you haven't seen that video, there is a recall on the um, shock tower mounts because of rust that gets in there, and they have a new plastic cap that goes on. Um, in my case, it did appear that the rust had penetrated pretty deep inside there and probably affected the little bearing that's in the top hat, which was causing the spring to bind up and clunk every now and then. We're not 100% sure if that's what it was, but uh, that's what we're going with at this point. So other than those little things, I honestly have not had any other trouble uh, with the car that I didn't cause personally. And as you guys have watched along in my videos, I've caused myself plenty of problems with this car, but uh, nothing significant, just kind of things that happen when you're off-roading and doing different goofy stuff. So, all right, guys, well, that's pretty much the 13,000 mile update. As always, as I mentioned earlier, if you have questions or comments, leave those below or send me an email. I'm happy to help out the best I can. And if I don't know, I will certainly try to put you in touch with somebody that does. So. We'll talk to you soon. Hope everybody's well. Have a great week.